Hi everyone, welcome to this week's uh, webinar. Uh, this is uh, May 3rd and uh, we're going to be working with Renee Montoya from the Foundation for California Community Colleges today to cover some of the questions and run you through the process for the uh, PayCom payroll system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Salomon's not able to join us at the moment. He's in the air, but if he lands in time, he will call in and join us. Otherwise, uh, we can answer the questions uh, that you write in the, um, in the chat box, uh, or if you have a complex question, uh, you can use the raise hand function and we'll work with your question at the end. Okay, um, if we're ready, we'll start. Thank you very much for joining us, Renee. Um, and just for the moment, I'm going to run through a couple of ongoing items for the CCC Maker project, and then we're going to, to turn over uh, to you. So of course, the, the, the big thing that's going on right now is that everyone's working on their year two work plans and budgets. These are due this Friday. Uh, important point, this is the same way we did it last year where we've asked you to submit a, a, a work plan and budget. We will then um, uh, review it and if there are minor suggestions, we'll just email you. Otherwise, we may just ask for a quick Zoom meeting to ask clarifying questions or make suggestions uh, about how you might want to modify your work plan and considerations for your budget. So uh, I'm pleased to say that many of the colleges have signed up for a one hour consultation with Salomon and, and me going into the uh, process. And I think that's really helpful. Uh, we still have a couple of slots on Friday. If you are running, uh, if, you are, if, if you have questions that you would like to run by us um, at the last moment. Our, our goal is to have all the work plans and budgets approved within hopefully two or so weeks from receiving them. We'll be reviewing them in the order that they're submitted. So um, please be aware that the sooner you get them in, the better. Uh, also, on approval of the budget and work plans, we will be initiating the next, the contract process for year two. So um, be aware that that will be coming up as well. Uh, the Kumu uh, Metamap pro project is underway and I'm pleased to say that a number of colleges have already submitted their modified uh, Kumu spreadsheet so that um, the guys at Kumu can build us a fabulous um, meta map with um, thousands of contacts on it. It's going to be extraordinary. So please make sure that you upload your uh, your uh, database uh, spreadsheet to the Dropbox. If you're having any problems with it, please email and let me know. Uh, we're also, uh, so we've signed up a lot of people for the Bay Area Maker Fair uh, booth. And I know a number of colleges are also um, traveling on their own and having their own booths. So please, if you're interested in connecting um, and volunteering at the booth or coordinating presentations, etc., please contact Belaine through email. She'll be taking care of that. And uh, just a couple of last things. Uh, workplace is going very well for the people who are using it regularly. I know that more people are checking in and uh, watching what's going on, but we strongly encourage everyone to post. And one of the reasons for this is we seem to have hit uh, a critical mass with activities in the project. It's become uh, I'm glad to say it's reached the point where there's so much going on that we can't simply report on it in, um, in a weekly webinar. It's really important that you stay up to date with all of the uh, developments by uh, accessing Workplace. There is, uh, there is links to curriculum that's been developed. There's a lot of information about um, uh, tools and equipment that people are purchasing. So there's some pretty good conversations going on about um, selection processes and the advantages of different things. So um, that's what's going on. Oh, and also the data dashboard that we, uh, we previewed last week is also up and running. So we strongly suggest you jump in there and have a look at how your data is contributing to the overall success of the project. So thanks very much for that. Um, I want to move on now to uh, Renee and um, 
we'll start by just doing a quick review of the the phases of the internships and this is just a quick review to create a, a context for the um, for the description that uh, Renee will be giving so you know first off remember that the internships are the key outcome of the CCC maker project and we are aiming all together collectively to achieve 800 internships by the end of next May May 2019 and it's crucial that we are engaging employers and students in this process because we know that work-based learning in all of its forms and particularly in internships is a really valuable experience for the students it helps them gain employment it helps them uh, investigate career opportunities and uh, it's it also builds 21st century skills so we are really emphasizing this as we go into year two, that the internship uh, programs within each college uh, should be in full steam. Uh, there is the requirement of the uh, in, uh, in, sorry, student um, paperwork for their uh, onboarding process. Uh, the, the students have to be onboarded into the PACOM system through the Foundation for Community Colleges before they can um, start the internship. Uh, the internship then commences and then we have the offboarding of the student at the end, which includes the payment and this is a, a crucial part that we're um, clarifying right now. Okay, while you are onboarding students, and this has been going on, I know, through the first year, and um, many of you have created extraordinary relationships with stakeholders, um, with employers outside of the, um, uh, your normal uh, ecosystem, so you're really expanding. Um, we also have uh, some suggestions on how you can engage stakeholders and uh, use uh, use the opportunity to to really build your community uh, so think about how you prepare your outreach material and and plan events how are you recruiting your employers are you bringing them into your advisory are they uh, connected to your college in other ways do they are they coming to you through your college internship program or are you building new relationships make sure you can really communicate and coordinate um, with with the uh, college itself many of you are using uh, your internship services on campus and coordinating with them so keeping your lines of communication open is really important as these um, uh, internships continue to roll out uh, we have a frequently asked question page which you can go to where you can um, look at responses to questions the link is in this presentation and uh, we'll have a look at it later uh, and then make sure that you're regularly scheduling information sessions um, to, to update your uh, expertise and knowledge uh, as you're developing your system. These systems are all very new and they're going to evolve and change as you uh, learn and develop best practices. Okay, so now I'm going to turn over to Renee. Thank you so much for joining us, Renee. We're going to, uh, we're looking forward to hearing you as, as you take us through the checklist. And um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now if, if you want to take over or I can continue running this, the, the slides for now. Um, I'm gonna, um, I'll have you continue running the slides until I go over the onboarding offboarding checklist. And then we'll go back to the list. Okay, great. All right then. Away we go. Thanks. So um, I'm. Hello everyone. Um, I'm glad to be on because I know there. Um, this is a new pilot and a new process for everyone. And I know that these internships they last only 20 hours. Um, and for those colleges that are on that have extended up to 60, but um, it is really fast paced. Um, I have received a lot of feedback, which is why I'm here today to kind of help clarify the process and um, also beyond for any questions that I can answer all at once. So we're going to start with um, beginning with the PACOM steps. Um, in, this, in these slides, Solomon and Deborah have given you guys links to the checklist, which I'm going to go over in a minute, and also a fact sheet. 
and those fact, that fact sheet goes over um, some items, but not all the questions that you might have, but it is a really good resource to have and to reference. So um, the first step with the onboarding process is that um, once you have the employer site and then you have the student and the student's been selected, they apply online um, through our online application link and most of you have done that, so thank you for that and it's been pretty seamless with that. Once that they apply, then you need to email me the additional steps, which would be the details for the internship. So that would be the student's name, the start date, the estimated end date, the timekeeping supervisor, um, which typically you all have been great about giving me who the timekeeping supervisor is before I even receive student information. So thank you for that. And then um, I need that. that starting five days before their start date. So say if the they're gonna start on, they were supposed to start on Monday, I would need their information by last Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, in order to have them onboarded by 4.30, which was last Monday. Um, we do ask for now for a five day, um, just waiting period just because we start with summer programs and we hire about 400 to 500 students and um, youth over the summer and we just need a little bit more time to onboard them. So um, we're, we are asking, it was two days, um, but now it's going to go to five days. Uh, we also, just to kind of reiterate from the previous webinar, we partner with our finance team. So um, we do, we do have the pay period calendar out there. And just so you know, when it comes to payroll processing, um, which happens on the Monday and Tuesday after timesheets are due, finance is very, very backed up. So if there is the five day, you know, turnaround time frame, I am asking for that just in case the student is starting on a payroll processing week. So um, there's a little backstory to that. Um, and then uh, we'll go to the next slide, please, Deborah. Thank you so much. So once I, ha I have the student's information, you allow me five days to enter them into the system before their first day. Um, so say their first day was 4.30. Um, we do ask, and you'll see these on the onboarding steps, that their I-9 is completed and then their completed by them and then verified by the timekeeping supervisor on their first day. So I do recommend setting aside at least like a half an hour for the student to, to complete their new hire documents to complete their I-9 and then for you also to then log in and verify their documents and complete their I-9. The online documents, the new hire documents, although there's about there's a good number of them. They only take about 10, 15 minutes to do. Um, it's all, as some of you have seen, it's just you know verifying that they've received it or creating a signature for it. So one that they really need to do on their first day if they cannot do their new hire documents on the first day is the I-9 because it's a federal time sensitive document. Um, basically, the I-9 is the same information they're entering in for their application. There's just a couple more check boxes and they need to sign it. So it's very simple, easy form for them to do. Um, but then the time TV supervisor needs to complete it. And by federal law, within three days of the employee's first day, but since these internships are so short, we do ask that it's completed on the first day. So um, that is the I-9. Um, the internship begins, then they'll start logging their time into Paycom. And if they do have a schedule from the work site that shows that they're completing it within one week, we do ask that, that they put in their time for that one week, either on their first or second day, because if they're gonna start on 4.30 and end on 5.4, we need to have enough time to make sure that their time card's approved and then we have time to process and mail out their final check. So um, that 
kind of skipped over these slides a little bit, but um, for that process, and that's kind of still with the onboarding process, receiving that information, um, that estimated end date. Again, um, if their end date tends to change from the estimated end date, if it's going to be, turns out to be a week, and instead of two weeks, the foundation needs to be notified of that, the change to the estimated end date, because it is just an estimate. We all know that things happen, sometimes students get sick, sometimes if they can't make it to work, we can't put an actual hard end date on there, and I understand that. Um, and then... Um, I'm sorry, Renee. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say that with that end date, and it, it's been a problem for a couple of the colleges, um, one of the solutions that we identified was that maybe uh, the last hour of the internship should be an exit interview with the um, the internship coordinator. And that way, they're not signing out for the full 20 hours on their time card, um, and uh, except under the um, supervision of the coordinator who's offboarding them. And that means that if there's a, a meeting set, that paycheck can be um, deliverable on that day. So a student may finish the work at the, uh, at the employer's site uh, at 19 hours one week, and then the exit interview could be the following week, and that would be the last day of the internship. And this works for everyone because it gives the, um, the internship coordinator an opportunity to follow up on the, uh, on the internship while it's, uh, you know, as it's just being completed. And it also gives uh, Renee and her team more time to make sure that the check is going to be ready. If that helps. So that's why we've got the last day exit interview on, on as part of that um, process. And that will um, help. We're starting to roll out an offboarding checklist. So that would be perfect to have that exit interview because then the student can complete their um, change to relationship form, um, which notifies them that they're no longer a employee of the foundation. And also, if say this was their only job, um, we also give out unemployment brochures as well. So um, this would be really good for them to have if they're looking for this was their only job at the time and they're not continuing anywhere else. Right. And, and Renee, can you do me a favor and let us know what happens if that student does not receive that paycheck on the last day? So by California law, uh, no matter the termination, an employee has to receive their final pay on their last day of work. Um, if they do not receive their final pay on the last day of work, the employee is owed what is called waiting penalties, which is an average day wages up to 30 days. So that means um, for up to 30 days, if that employee does not receive their check, they get paid for all 30 days at an average of what their time would be. So say a employee through the CCC student, through the CCC maker um, initiative works only 20 hours and then it's five hours um, for say four, so four days for five hours over the pay period um, each week up to 20 hours. If they don't receive their check, we have to pay them waiting penalties, and that would be for five hours. So that's their day would be five hours of pay every day that they don't receive their check. Um, that includes weekends. So, so basically that means that there is money coming out of, your, uh, of the college internship fund uh, with the uh, foundation that will um, will be spent on penalties rather than on the internship. So we're, the reason we're really stressing this is that uh, you, you have a certain allocation of funds for internships. And unfortunately, if, if it starts going on penalties, that will diminish the number of interns that you'll be able to pay through the, through the project. So this is a, it's a really important consideration. Um, we we want to make sure that we're not spending money on penalties. That rather we're actually spending money on on the the formal internship. Yeah. Oh, and, um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. And I just want to, Avante had a question. She'd, she said, can you repeat that uh, California law about the last day of work? Yes. So um, it's, per California law, if an, on the employee's last day of work, they need to receive their final paycheck. If they do not receive their final paycheck on their last day of work, then they are owed what is called waiting penalty. And it's uh, no matter the termination, so it could be involuntary or voluntary. We deem um, internships such as these as involuntary. That's just how we deem it in our system. Um, anything, it's also considered a mutual separation. But um, it is deemed involuntary um, and they must have their check. Uh, the reason it's deemed involuntary under, uh, according to our HR department, is because the student would want to continue on and work as an employee, even though the contract is ended. Right. Um, some yeah. of these students, I know they're continuing to work at the school. However, as the employer, the foundation of the employer, we are required to give when the relationship ends to give them their check on their final day. Right. Um, Dominic just asked about the checklist and I will um, copy and paste the, um, the link to the checklist in just a second. Okay. So, um, that's it. Sh shall we move on? Renee, do you want to? I was actually gonna um, go over the checklist and then cool. if anyone would also like to see Paycom one more time for me to kind of go over that, I am more than happy to log in and to show you either from the student's perspective or the timekeeping supervisor's perspective. Oh, that would be great. So um, how about I, um, I'll stop sharing if you'd like to share your screen and we can switch over. There we go. Can everyone see the onboarding and offboarding checklist? Yes. Oh, okay, and, great. And oh. uh, now we're on the Paycom client menu. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me. Actually, I wanted to share my whole screen. There we go. Can you see the checklist now? Yes. Okay. So um, this is just going to go over what we briefly talked about. I'm a very visual person. I like to see things laid out in front of me. Um, so um, this is just a little bit more updated than what you all previously received um, a couple months ago. So um, we're going to start with responsibilities of the college, which is to start outreach, recruit employers through visits and outreach activities, confirm employer host site. Um, then if there is an employer host site, if it's not at the college, you need to complete a work site evaluation, um, submit electronic version or scan paper version. For the work site agreement, it needs to be um, sent to me via email along with the student information. Um, if there is one work site and three students, I just need one work site agreement. So I don't need three different work site agreements um, unless you prefer to have three for each student, but I just need one. So um, once the work site agreement is executed, recruit the students. Um, you could either have a student before the work site or after, either way. Um, and then we go into the completion of day step four and five below. So student completes the online application once they're recruited. Um, this application, like I said before, is just like the I-9 where it's just gathering sensitive information. Um, so basically the social security number. I do have to note that the social security number and the date of birth are voluntary for the student to input into Paycom. However, um, Paycom requires 
those two things to be in their profile when I'm setting it up. So I have noticed that a lot of students, because it is voluntary and they do not have to give that information, don't, don't provide it. However, PACOM requires it. So if you could stress to the students when you're providing the application to them that they need to input their social security number and their date of birth. Um, I had to email a number of students for their social security numbers and their birthdays. I don't mind doing so. It's just they don't really know who I am yet and where I fit in into the internship. And it's, it can be kind of awkward. Um, but I also don't want them to think that it's some, I try to do as much as possible so they don't think I'm doing like a phishing scam or anything on them. So um, just please have them fill out that portion. So the next, after they complete the application, um, I would request that they get the application, they complete it, and then once you have confirmation that they've completed the application, then to notify me with their information. Um, if I get a list of students and they haven't applied and I'm and they have and their start dates coming up, I can't add them. So if they have it say have a start date of 430 and then on Friday 427 they still haven't applied, I do tend to reach out. But um, moving forward I, I I can no longer do that. The student has to be in the system and I have to be able to pull their application and I have to have enough time to do so because I do work with other departments. So please have them complete the application and then make sure that they notify you that the application is complete and then send me step five. So that would be like it says, student name, pay rate, start date, um, estimated end date. I know stuff happens again, it's not set in stone. Um, college internship coordinator, also called timekeeping supervisor. Um, job description and work site agreement if it's off campus. So again, the job description some, sometimes um, is entered into the work site agreement as part of the work site agreement. If that's the case, then you only need to send me the work site agreement if the job description is embedded in there. Um, if it's not, then I do need the job description. The reason being is because we have to classify a worker's compensation code to that student. And if at the time when we're audited, we don't have a job description, um, we get dinged for it. So we do need a job description for that. It also helps in the event that there's a worker's compensation claim at the work site or at the college. Thank, thanks, Renee. Um, I noticed a question from Michael Hoffman. Um, he's saying, how do we receive confirmation that the student has completed the online application? So it should be communicated to the students once you give them the email. I would recommend that you give the email to, say, Mary, say, Mary, um, congratulations on the internship. You would give her the application and then let her know that once she's completed it to let you know. And that would be basically Mm. That's when you know to send me the information, it's confirmation that she's done the application. Another um, idea and another step that other clients use, which is they would, once the student's interested, they've accepted the internship, then you set aside time for them to complete the application with them, either in the same room or um, if they want, I'm not sure how it goes, but um, you can have them work at your computer, they have a laptop, just some kind of way that you know that they've completed it, or I would just have them let you know through email if they're going to do it at home. Okay, so um, there's not a, um, an automatic um, email that goes out to the, um, the work-based learning coordinator or the inter internship coordinator when the student no. is, okay. No, so. unfortunately it's yeah, so that timekeeping supervisor um, is not assigned to that student or slash employee until they've been added to PayPal. Right. So you know that they wouldn't receive any updates or pings or anything until the student's added and they're deemed their timekeeping supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, the student does receive a confirmation 
and it does say thank you for applying. So mm -hmm. the student receives it, but unless but that's only the student. Not yeah, they have to afford it. So it would be a really good idea to to be doing these applications like in in batches. If you can get the group of students together and have them all do it together in the lab over a lunch hour or something like that, then that would be a an efficient way of handling it. And then you'd know that it had taken place. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea because um, not only well, you know that's taken place. It, if you have a batch of 30, it really only takes about 10, 15 minutes to do the yeah. application, if that. And then you also are there to make sure that um, they do enter in their social security number and their date of birth. But you're there also to see the confirmation. Right, right. Uh, I also see another question from uh, Dominic. He's wondering, um, do we have to have the worksite agreement in place before we can I-9 the students? Uh, the worksite agreement needs to be in place before the student even starts working, yeah. so yes. Yeah, so it's always about setting up the employer relationship first, and yes, that's consistent with, with our messaging, so thank you. If um, it's at the college, if they're working at a makerspace at the college, for a work site, which I know that's happened. Some students are doing that, but they're not going to the work site to work. You don't, don't need a work site agreement because they're at the college. Okay, yep, makes sense. Great. Good. So we're gonna go back to the um, onboarding checklist and we're gonna go through um, so this is day five, which would be their first day. I would need five days to add the students to be added to payroll. And um, once on, the, on payroll, they're added to Paycom and they receive a Paycom generated email, which gives them their username and temporary password. And then they would log into Paycom with those items and they will then set up their security questions, change their password, and can root around and look at the system. This is typically done as soon as finance approves them in the system. So it's always done before I get a chance to send them their time card, how to create time cards and a pay period calendar email that welcomes them to the foundation. So um, some students will go in as soon as they receive it. Some students, it gets lost in their junk or they just don't look at it, which is completely fine. And um, then right after they're added, I get notified by finance and I send a welcome email. Okay. So um, once they get their welcome email, I let them know that they need to com that they have new hire documents that they should complete it on their first day. I also let them know about the I nine, and the I nine needs to be completed on their first day, and we. Um, I have taken some paper I-9s and um, that's okay in the past, but now that CCC Maker's ramping up, um, I do prefer that if everything's done on Paycom because it's less um, sensitive information through email and it's all kept in one spot. So the student completes all the new hard paperwork, the I-9 must be completed no later than the first day for the student, that's uh, federal law. Um, and then the timekeeping supervisor, it does say step eight, you'll get an automated, automated email from Paypal um, with your instructions. I typically do that as soon as um, anywhere, either after the student's added or if, as soon as you give me the student information. Um, I haven't really been giving usernames and passwords like right as I get the Smartsheet information. Um, just because I don't want it to get lost, but if you prefer to just receive your pass, your username and password up front instead of closer to when the student starts, um, just let me know and I can do it right away. So um, after the timekeeping supervisor gets their email, the internship, then they would go in and complete uh, Section two, the I-9, after the student has completed it, um, and we are asking them 
asking everyone to do it no later than the first day of employment for the student. Um, again, I did say earlier that uh, federally you have three days from the first day of hire, so if they started um, last, this last Monday on the 30th, the timekeeping coordinator supervisor has the first, second, has till today to close a business to complete section two. Um, because these internships are so short though, we are asking that it's done on the first day, um, and which is why it is a good thing if you're there working with them and going through the documents with them. Um, and then you can just verify the documents that you need to complete section two, and then you can complete it. Again, it's really easy. And then I'm gonna show you in a moment how to do it. So once that's done, um, schedule for the students. So you did previously give me an estimated end date. Um, we are asking that with that end date, you know, you have the exit interview and then um, you'll notify me if the estimated end date has changed. So I have seen that some internships are ending a week. If there's any way in one week rather than two weeks, if there's any way that if they're at the work site and you know that it's gonna be shorter than anticipated, then the work site needs to, and the student needs to communicate that to the timekeeping supervisor who needs to communicate that to the foundation. So um, that I, I really do stress that because if I'm given an end date of two weeks and then the student doesn't put their, and they so that the, a student started at the beginning of a pay period and their estimated end date was the end of the pay period, which is a two week period of time. And I was given an end date of the end of the pay period, but the student completed all of their time in the beginning of the, the first week of the pay period but didn't input their time until when timesheets are due at the end of the pay period, they were supposed to get their check a week ago. And if that doesn't make sense to anybody, please let me know and I can re-explain that. But um, what happens is those waiting penalties come into play. So for example, if a student was said to have been done on um, last pay period, which was 427 on that Friday, but they actually were done the first week at 420 and their time wasn't entered into Paycom or even approved until 427. Not only are they owed waiting penalties from the 21st up until the 27th, they also get waiting penalties for any time it takes us to send the check as well. And if it's an overnight check and we don't see this till Friday, we have to overnight it with a Saturday fee. So an overnight fee for a UPS check to be delivered is $30. For Saturday delivery, it's $26 extra dollars. So we're looking at a 56 overnight delivery fee, which will be invoiced to the college. Um, so that's why we do ask for more specific end dates and that way we're avoiding any kind of waiting penalties and any kind of overnight fees. So um, we're gonna go back to the student begins work, complete timesheet every other week. If the internship is two weeks or less, complete the timesheet in the first week, like I just said, an internship for all hours projecting future hours. Four days before the end of the internship, the student needs to complete and the supervisor needs to approve the final time card and pay from, and then notifies the foundation of the hard end date. Um, so before I'm notified that the employee's final date is say the fourth, the timesheet needs to be approved. I always check that. If the timesheet's not approved, payroll will not process the final check, unfortunately. So it has to be approved by the employee and by the supervisor. Um, if I go in there and I don't see it, then I'll just email everyone or call just to make sure that we get it done. And once once again, Renee, if if that time card is not approved um, and there's a delay in the check, then we're in the same problem with the waiting penalties. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, if it's not approved, um, then we have to wait for it to be approved, not only by the student, but also by the supervisor. It's different, and that's because of the final check, because we have to process it, and payroll won't process it without um, approval. Okay, okay. So, and that's the standard, so it's, it's not a situation where if the supervisor doesn't um, approve the time card, then it automatically goes into payroll? Because uh, Yeah, that's so with final checks, when um, I have to complete paperwork in Paycom and then it accompanies the final check. So with final checks, um, it's different because we have to cut it immediately oh. and we run a manual check. Um, but if it's just a payroll, if you're just processing payroll and the employee is just receiving a check for that pay period, um, that's correct, Deborah there actually doesn't need to be any approval from either the employee or the supervisor in order for those hours to go in. Just some hours need to be entered. And by law, we have to pay those hours if they're entered by the employee. So um, if the employee enters, say 40 hours into Paycom, doesn't approve it, the, the timekeeping supervisor doesn't know they did it, um, doesn't approve it, it will go in, it will get processed for payroll that employee will get a check or a direct deposit. So which this, is why we really yeah. uh, time keep supervisor approval. Right, so this could be a really big deal because if the supervisor doesn't check the time card during the ongoing period, not the final period, and the student accidentally puts down twice as many or three times as many hours as they're supposed to be working, then they will be paid for those hours unless the supervisor um, intervenes, right, and has it corrected. And that's when um, that's when the supervisor will notify the employee. You don't need to notify me that the hours aren't incorrect. Mm -hmm. I would say that would be a conversation with the employee to, to have them um, explain what happened. I can't delete hours. Right, um, right. And I and I I don't do so because um, I could get in trouble for that. Yeah. And also, um, I recommend as a timekeeping supervisor that you do not delete the hours unless you have email backup saying that having a conversation as to why the hours are there. Um, if there are hours in there and you delete them, and then the employee comes back and says, "But I worked those hours," um, we're looking at it's just not very good we're looking at yeah. the employee exactly yeah which is why it's up to the supervisor to contact the the employee the student and have them correct any errors before the end of the pay period um so and yeah, the student the student has to make that correction themselves correct and um that's another reason why um we've had a lot of questions as to why our time sheets do Thursday at 5 p.m. and the reason is because we have people that make errors and when I do time card audits and finance does their own for the foundation full-time employees um, we need to make sure that we have sufficient time which is basically just that Friday the next day to audit time cards and reach out to anyone to correct those errors um, if errors are on the time card, it either won't process properly or um, people don't get paid. And then there's a workaround. We have paper time, time sheets, but um, then they're not getting their funds in sufficient time and they're supposed to get them on payday. So that's why we do ask that they are due Thursday by 5 p.m. Um, just to give us that one day to audit. We do process payroll pretty early Monday morning and then time cards are locked, so they can't edit after that. Yeah, thanks Renee. And it, it's also, it's not just about whether the hours are correct, it's also about things like clocking in and out for breaks, correct? Yeah, and this is mostly, and uh, when Deborah means break, she means meal periods. Hmm. So when they take, um, if they're working more than, say they're working like more than six hours, they have to log a lunch unless they waive their lunch and we have a signed meal waiver on file. Um, if it's five hours, they work five hours, they don't have to take a lunch. 
they don't have to log their meal breaks so anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, um, which is up to the work site, uh, how long they want them to take it. And, but they do need to log their lunches. So I've seen a lot of students um, add hours, which is just a set of hours. That's something a salary individual would do. Um, they need to add punches. And um, that's in the creating timesheets PDF that I give them in their welcome email. They need to show their in time and out time. So unfortunately, just throwing in a bunch of hours and saying, you know, even if it is two hours, we need to show that in and out time because they are hourly employees. Yes, thank you, Renee. You're welcome. So um, previously, um, we're just going to go uh, to the days before the end of internship, the student completes and supervisor approves final time current pay call. We just went over that. We mail the check. Um, we send checks out UPS um, to track, and it takes about two to three days to get to the person's at home address. Um, but if we're going to start implementing this offboarding checklist, um, then we will send it UPS to the school or, or whoever's office um, so that they can hand deliver the check. So we do typically send it to the employee's home address, but we can always send it to the timekeeping supervisor. And I think um, it being part of the offboarding checklist would be perfect in doing so. Great. So the exit interview, the offboarding checklist is in PACOM. And um, as I explained before, it's the unemployment brochure as well as the change in relationship form. And then we're in the process of creating a student evaluation. And basically it's going to be a link to a Google form. And that Google form is gonna have all the questions and it's gonna be an evaluation not only of the program um, and their internship, but also of her catalyst that way Timekeeping supervisor, Solomon, Deborah, anyone can go into this Google form and grab the data. So that is shared instead of it being housed in Paycom. We find that once documents are completed in Paycom, um, we have it, HR has it set up so that supervisors can't go back in and grab the data. So unfortunately, um, it, we had to get a little bit more creative with that. So then um, after their exit interview and they're off board and they go through the off boarding checklist and they complete the evaluation, then the timekeeping supervisor will give them the check. Um, again, if the employee wants to receive the check at their home, they can do that as well. But like Deborah said, it's a really good um, conclusion by handing them their final paycheck. So that is the off boarding onboarding and offboarding checklist. Um, is there any questions before I go into Paycom? And I know we only have eight minutes, so um, I can go into Paycom really quickly, or I can jump on another webinar at another point. Um, Deborah, what do you think? Um, well, I'll, I'll see if who, I would love to have another webinar because obviously this material is really dense. There's a lot to, to get through. Um, so yeah, we could schedule another webinar. I just want to ask the, the people online, put your hand up if you want to have a quick look at um, the interface or whether, yeah, if you'd like to, I'm just seeing. Nope, I don't see hands going up. I, I think, oh, hang on, no, I do, four, yeah. So there are a few people who would like to, um, who'd like a quick look. Okay, so um, I, let's I have about five more minutes, I just have a hard stop at two because I have to go to another meeting. Um, mm -hmm. But I will, I'm actually already logged into Paycom so I can show you how to log yeah. into Paycom. Great, and, let's, um, let's just do a couple of minutes and then we'll follow up with another webinar in a, in a week or two. Um, Dominic, you asked also, um, I'm sorry I missed your question, about whether 16 or 17 year olds are allowed. Um, that is really up to CCC maker and really, I'm not sure if that's a Solomon question or not, but I mean, we work with clients um, and minors, so we allow them to be on our payroll. It's just really up to 
CCC maker and if that's something that you guys want to allow us. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be specifically college students. Yeah, we, we, can, uh, we can answer that question at a later time. Thank you, okay. that's a good question. So now I'm going to show Paycom. And can everyone see it okay? Mm hmm Okay. So um, this is Paycom. This is what it looks like from the from my view. Um, you guys will see a couple, a little, some icons won't be there. So what I'm going to really show you um, that I get a lot of questions about is how to get into the I-9. So for the I-9, we're going to go into Talent Management. I'm sorry, Human Resources, Document and Task Management. And then Task Management Dashboard. These are in the steps that I give um, every timekeeping supervisor with their login information. So um, what you want to do is then go into So we have um, this student who actually is um, brand new and she needs to complete her, she completed her I-9. She completed most of her documents. Um, this is an actual profile. Um, this is not a test subject. So now it's time for the supervisor to complete the I-9. The supervisor will get a ping from Paycom in their email that says that the I-9 has been complete. Once they get that ping, if they're not completing the I-9 with the student on the first day, then they would go into Paycom, um, either have those two forms of documents in their hands, or I recommend copies. If you don't have time to do the I-9 on the first day with the student, I would make copies, put them in a safe, secure place, hopefully it's locked up. Once you bring them out, when you're ready to do the I-9, and then shred them so that they're no longer available or hanging around. So now it's time for the employer right here to do the I-9. I'm going to start the task. I'm not actually going to do this because I don't have her document. This is what it will look like on your screen. You can view section one um, and it just has all the information that they entered. So like address, um, social security number, email address, phone number, so the same information that they filled out for the application is shown in section one. I'm not gonna show this because this is an actual employee and I cannot share their social. So section two, um, they have places for instructions to look at the I-9 handbook. I really don't recommend going to these. They're kind of heavy, very dense resources. I, if you have any questions, please just call me or email me. Um, but if you need help right away, please call me. So um, underneath, you'll see their name, and then underneath their name, you have an option to do a list A document, which is a passport or a US passport card. The one thing um, Paycom does not let you do as a list A document is a permanent resident card. So if that comes into play, then a paper form I-9 will need to be done. Um, and then we'll just have to upload it into Paycom. I'm not sure why that's not an option for list day, but it is an option. You would enter in, so it would be passport. It is always US Department of State, that's who the issuing authority is. You would enter the document number, the expiration date. You do not need to scan and upload the copies of their documents. That's an option um, that Paycom has for all their clients. Some employers do it, some employers don't. The foundation doesn't do it, so we don't require career countless um, participants to do it as either. Then you would put in their first day of employment. So let's say it was the first. You click to sign. Um, I have a signature already in there. You can make one, um, or it gives you the option to type one in. So then I would sign it. I would put my title. Location is always one. This is also in the instructions I give. You need to scroll all the way down and then one is our address. So even if a paper form I-9 is being completed, it always needs to have the foundation's address, um, which is always in my signature, if you don't know where that address is. Um, if you 
don't remember it's in my signature and if you need it, just email me or call me and I can give it, I can provide it to you. Once you've entered in all information, you would select update and then it would be completed. Um, if they're not providing a passport, but instead two forms of documents, then you would get, there's a list of documents. Typically it's driver's license, ID card, or school ID, but not always. So we can't tell people that those are the only forms of ID. The second would be typically either a birth certificate or a social security card. Again, the same as list A, you would just enter in the information. You do not need to scan a copy and, and upload it. Um, you do not need to provide additional information. You would put in their start date, you would sign it, put in your title, and it, your name will, again, already populate like mine did, mine did because you're in your own account. And then you need to select one for location and then update. So um, I do recommend when you're talking to the student and you give them the application link, I do say in my welcome emails now, just from some feedback from timekeeping supervisors, that they need to provide um, the timekeeping supervisors two forms of ID. So um, I do just let them know that on their first day. But um, if you could also, as a timekeeping supervisor, let them know to bring two forms of ID on their first day or one form if it's a passport. Um, just so that you can complete their I-9 and one if you're doing an onboarding session with them. Any oh. questions? I think we're looking good. I think we're fine and we can follow up with, uh, I'm sure people will contact with other, us with other questions as, as things progress. Thank you so much, Renee, for uh, taking the time today to run us through this process. Um, we've got a couple of resources now for the uh, schools to use with the checklist and I'm sure that's going to be really useful. And we'll schedule another um, webinar in a couple of weeks, I guess, to, uh, to go into more depth uh, in, in PACOM. I think that'll be terrific. Yeah, All I'd right. love to do that. Um, yeah. Also, if anyone has any questions um, about PACOM, particularly about PACOM, please um, email me if there are program questions or about the CCC Maker um, Initiative Makerspace, please um, email Deborah and Solomon. All right. Well, thank you very much, Renee. And uh, it's been great talking with you today. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and I'll post it on Workplace this afternoon. So you'll be able to check in and replay anything you need. All right, then. Well, thanks very much. And we'll see everyone later. Thank you, Deborah. All right. Thanks. Bye.